and I'm a narrative designer here at Big Huge Games, 38 Studios. A narrative designer is, you know, it's kind of a catch-all. There's a lot of different things we do. It's like a writer for quests and quest content implementer, but we also do things like we set up um, non-quest content, like village dialogue and stuff like that. I'm Eric Capone. I'm the principal narrative designer on Reckoning. I oversee the creative side of the narrative department, the writing, the lore creation, are part of the world that we're working in. As much as this game is about awesome combat, it's also about showing the world this, the realms of Amalur, and you know, what, like introducing all these concepts, like this, this intellectual property that R.A. and Todd McFarlane and Kurt and they all sort of created together. Building a world that feels connected and that has a cohesiveness, uh, especially one of this size, is a huge challenge. It's been a huge challenge, and going into it, we knew it was going to be massive. Uh, terrifying, actually. <laughs> Working with Ari Salvatore, it's kind of a, a nerd fantasy. There's a lot of talk about how we've been given this 10,000 year history, and then he's developed it, and we're working on it with him. Um, I mean, that, that's very true. I haven't worked with a, like a big name like Ari Salvatore before, you know, like New York Times bestseller. Like everyone knows who this guy is. He's surprisingly down to earth, easy to deal with. You know great guy, certainly knows what he's doing very, very well. He's really receptive and he's really open. It doesn't matter what your background is, you know, he just loves stories. To be able to sit in a room full of, of narrative designers and writers and designers um, and, you know, throw out ideas and have him critique it as, the, you know, as though we're all there uh, working together, you know, for a common purpose uh, and, you know, kind of seeing his face light up at some ideas and then, you know, not really register other ones or kind of seeing the gears turn and then having him suddenly come up with something that can, you know, take what you've got, what you've done and, and just make it so much better. Uh, that was, you know, very satisfying. It's a really good environment to foster people in. I think he's got a really fostering personality. It's just this really cool collaborative process where the two of us are working together. Ken is sort of like Unique. Unique is a good word to describe Ken Ralston. It's difficult to sometimes think of Ken Ralston as human, I would say. You sometimes get a little angel and a little devil on your shoulder telling you to do things. You're like, well, I don't know if I should be doing, like, I should know if I should be implementing this quest this way. And Ken is both at the same time yelling in your ear like, what are you doing? Don't do this. Oh my gosh, you need to try this out just to see what it looks like. He's had a huge influence on my design kind of evolution. There are great designers, there are great writers, there are a lot of different things you can be. And Ken, in addition to being a great designer and a great writer and a host of other things, he's also a great teacher. He's at such a high level of like thought that seems so, you know, focused. He's just got this mind that works so much to try and figure out like what is the bare, like when you boil everything in Reckoning down, what's left, you know, what is the player experience. His direction uh, has been integral to sort of Everything from the tone of the narrative to uh, you know the quest structures we employ, um, and just having him here as a, a sounding board for everything is an incredible asset. The main story of Reckoning is really one about who do you want to be as a person. Your character in the game is given an opportunity that no one has ever had before. They're free of the forces that control everyone. Decides who is going to be who and what everybody's gonna do. And you're the first person who's ever been able to live outside of that. So where you go and what you do is impacting the entire world around you. A universe that's been on rails for the last however many millennia is starting to tilt. And this is the point of divergence. It's as much about figuring out who you're going to be as who you were. Who you were can almost be irrelevant if you have a chance to wipe your slate clean and become someone else entirely. 
We wanted to look at other ways to accentuate the narrative, to bring it out, to make it a huge part of, of the gameplay and of the, the immersion aspect of the game. There's a lot of players that really want to buy into what they're doing and like they want to interact with this world and part of that involves sort of getting them into the, the setting, getting them into to buy into characters and finding like, you know, maybe I want to fight these guys because they burned down this village or something like that. What we wanted to do was to, to make sure every area in the game had its own identity and even its own story. Because, you know, in a lot of RPGs, especially large, vast, open-world RPGs, there's a lot of dead space. You're running around in the world, killing things, you've got this great combat system, but if you're not doing it for a reason, then it sort of starts to lose it after a while. You can still create a world that's vast and that it's deep, um, but have something to do all the time. Most of the places you come to have their own, you know, village with something going on, you know, a warlord or uh, a despot that's taken over an entire region and you have to oust him, a city under siege, all these little uh, stories which for me are the reason I play games is for the personal stories, the characters. Creating spaces this way not only informed the world design, you know, the art aspect of it, but also really helped us to tell human stories in a fantasy world. Factions and Reckoning are a lot like small main quests. They're not exclusive, they don't cut the player off from content, but they uh, do provide whole new branches that the player can explore. And the great thing is too, because of our destiny system, the player can unlock new destinies, new identities, new ways of playing, new buffs, skills, all that kind of stuff, through the factions that they couldn't normally. The Travelers are a group of gypsy people um, who sort of make their living as thieves in the Feylands. They're sort of Robin Hood-esque without any of the gentility, you know, the common folk love them because they stick it to the rich, but they don't necessarily give to the poor and the travelers are happy to enjoy the respect without having to share any of the loot. A thief skilled has to play a certain way. There are certain player expectations for like sneaking around and, you know, stealing stuff and so that was approached from a very gameplay oriented perspective. Like, well, what would be cool things that the player would get to steal? And one of the examples was like, well, what if you could steal a lock pick that could unlock any lock? And we're like, okay, that's pretty cool except it's locked in an unopenable box. And then, you know, we're trying to come up with these weird puzzles and scenarios that the player has to deal with. We want to make the player feel like Mission Impossible, you know, only it's more like Mission Improbable when the player's around. The idea with the House of Ballads with the Fae is that because they are a race that lives long lives and then they die and they regenerate and they come back to life, they sort of have this ongoing history that never actually becomes history because it's sort of a living thing. It's as if George Washington crossed the, you know, the Delaware, died, and then came back and crossed the Delaware again. Everybody has a role or an archetype, and uh, they play out that role to the best of their ability, and that's where they fit into the culture and the society. The House of Ballads are the heroes that go through their quests and adventures, vanquish their creatures, vanquish the villains, um, you know, go quest and secure great artifacts and weapons, and then they die, and they come back, and they do it all again. These stories, these great Fae songs that they call them the ballads, they are embedded in Fae, uh, fae consciousness. Uh, and so, you know, the great heroes, Hal and the White, King Wenson, Queen Belmaid, and their villain, you know, their, um, their nemesis, the Maid of Windermere, these are all names that are known to all Fae, uh, and uh, their stories live on forever because they continue to tell them. The player is coming into a faction where all the stories have been told, and they're told a certain way, over and over again. And like in any good RPG, the player is an agent of change. So the player comes in, and things suddenly start to go crazy. And so all these stories that are set in stone um, suddenly start taking new twists. Their presence there starts to throw the established story into a shambles. Fae represent nature. Um, and the Summer Fae and the Winter Fae sort of are two opposite ends of the spectrum. So the winter fae represent like the entropic part of nature, like rotting and decay and festering and cold and winter and death and all that stuff. So they're very like fatalistic and stuff by their nature. Like it's, they, they have this essence of corruption and decay. And so I came up with the House of Sorrows and they're basically like a church of winter fae. And all they do is they sort of assume this decaying essence out of their brethren. They're like a faction of scapegoats, and all they do is they, they, they reach into you and they take all the bad stuff out, and that lets these winter fae sort of build their own court of winter and have their own kings and sort of do all the stuff that might be contrary to their nature. The thing is, the Tuatha have no need for that. The Tuatha have this scary new god, they have this magical prismere that lets them sort of 
corrupt themselves into something that's not really tied to winter or nature at all. They become unnatural. And so the, the Tuatha basically want to become, want, want the Winter Fae to join them. So they're trying to get rid of the House of Sorrows. The, the lines between Winter Fae and Tuatha start to blur and he has to sort of figure out like who's spying for who. And it's all like a, a very like roguish, sneaky political game. Every player who comes to Amalur, <laughs> uh, I don't know what brought them. I want them to have a good time. I mean, I don't want it to be something where they ever regret having loaded into that space or having walked into that tavern. It's something where I want them to be doing something or uh, stimulated in some interesting way every moment they're in the game world. In any RPG, you want the player to walk away and feel like they were the main character, you know, that this is a game that's about them. There are moments of peace and quiet. There are moments of great beauty uh, where the player can you know, travel the world and, and see it in any way they choose, but I, I want them to always feel like there's something they can do, something that's, that's catching their interest just around the corner. Um, I want it to be a really fun experience uh, and it's something that, that uh, you know, they won't forget. Reckoning is about the player because the player is this moment in the Amalur storyline. Like the whole Amalur universe, the player is the one thing that changes the face of it. And that's what I want the player to like, I want the player to basically like walks away from the game feel like like an astrological event you know like he wants to feel like he was planets aligning and making all that stuff come together because he was the world of amalur is really interesting to me it it goes a lot deeper even than we've been able to explore in this game it, we, i could do this until the end of time there's so much here to work with and there's so much more that can be created and it's such a deep and interesting world with so many secrets that and you, know, you start pulling one string and the, it comes apart and there's just more and more and more and more under there.